Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to Uncle Bobby's Country Corner, where real men don't play. Got a couple of matters I want to take care of right off the bat. Brother David Banner will will be unable to participate in today's show. He was traveling all over the country, and he called me this morning just dog-tired. And also, Jim Brown had to leave early for Washington, D.C. However, you will be able to see an exclusive interview that I did with Jim in the next couple of days that is phenomenal and it explains a lot of the reasons why this show is being aired to accomplish a couple of things best practices and models of possibility i'm fortunate enough to have in studio with me today someone i've known for over 30 years and he is a living example of not what he says but what he's done his name is wendell stemley He's president of the National Association of Minority Contractors. He also runs a construction management and engineering firm, Black IPO. Wendell, welcome to Uncle Bobby's Country Corner. I'm glad to be here. And we're going to get right into why I decided to do this show. It's about problem solving and creating a gateway to success in a country that we've had a tremendous amount of problems being successful in. Wendell, if you would, please let my audience know what it is that you do right now that affects positive social and economic change for black people in particular, and sometimes you employ other people in in various capacities. Well, projects uh, through the National Association of Minority Contractors is the oldest a minority trade association in the United States. Um, to that end, we deal with trade workers, vendors, suppliers, subcontractors, and general contractors uh, in the construction field. A big problem that has occurred in the last 30 years has been the divesting of uh the black community from the trades associated with uh, factory and construction-related working. Uh, There was a concept that uh, no kid left behind, uh, college preparatory, and we kind of missed the ball on keeping a steady flow of young men and women into the trade uh, capacity. To that end, we are now faced with African-American males being between 18 and 35, being the largest unemployed group in the United States of America. Um, This has wrecked havoc on our local communities because that unemployment and poverty has led to alternative lifestyle and alternative ways of trying to make a living that sometimes isn't in their best interest or the best interest of the community. So how did you arrive at a point where you were able to feed people through your leadership? How did you arrive at that destination where you, across the country, are able to take people who were otherwise unemployable and put them in a position where they could make beyond a living wage and change their lives and stabilize some communities? Well, I think a lot of majority and minority firms have that opportunity. It's just are they willing to do the hard work to go into the community and vet out these young people and try to put some of them in a uh, living wage. Uh, They will work hard. They will be loyal for $30 an hour. You won't keep their interests at a minimum wage job, but for a liberal wage job, um, they're willing to do the hard work. It's are the employers, are the uh, governmental entities willing to do the hard work on their end to make sure that they have a shot at that uh, at that job. So we're in Los Angeles in the heart of the Crenshaw District at Morris Media Studios. Right outside this door on Crenshaw Boulevard, there's a 
multi-billion dollar construction project going on. Mm. List a couple of projects that you have people working locally right now in the greater Los Angeles area. Well, we've been working at uh, Los, uh, Los Angeles Airport for over 10 years. Uh, we work for the uh, rail lines. We work downtown on Figueroa. So it's a plethora of projects around town that you can work on. The key is, as you go into a community like uh, Watts and you're working Martin Luther King Hospital, what is your commitment to truly uh, make 10% of those jobs available for disadvantaged workers? And those are workers that are chronically unemployed, are newly released from incarceration, and get them the skill sets and the training on the job to be part of that workforce. That becomes the the key. You have to make the commitment. If you're going to build a hundred or two hundred million dollar project in a community, then it takes the government, the city council, the county commissioners, the general contractors, all the managers and subcontractors to have that same commitment to employ that local community uh, on that job. And I think the communities around the country should stand up and demand participation in projects being built in their community. How important is it for a community to understand and appreciate supporting the construction community with respect to members of your association. And for example, you've got some projects around the country in your capacity as the National Association of Minority Contractors that is putting a dent in the poverty cycle. For example, in uh, the NFL, you have successfully interfaced with the Minnesota Vikings and the Atlanta Falcons. Can you talk about those two particular scenarios for me, please? Well, the NAMAC members usually pursue being part of some of the largest projects in the United States. Uh, as projects are getting ready to roll out, uh, we kind of target what is going to be the next big infrastructure project or what's going to be the next large uh, sports facility and pursue being on those teams. Uh, in the case of the Vikings, uh, we had a, a local member, Thor Construction, that's from uh, Minnesota, actually became a partner with Martison on building that project. Once we're able to do that, and that gives us access to what's the labor pool going to look like for employment. And if we stay true to who we are and we pursue making sure that we get workers from the local community and from diverse backgrounds uh, to be part of that, I think as that money then rolls back into the community, as uh, wage earners, that will stem the tide of poverty, will stem the tide of violence, will stem the tide of despair, where a young man or woman will feel uh, value in what they're doing on a daily basis. Compton, California <clears throat> is a community that you have changed a number of lives on a couple of different projects. Could you elaborate on those projects and the social and economic impact of being able to take people who had heretofore never worked a, a, a so-called real job and the changes in, in their lives that were created by being able to participate in construction in Nicholson Gardens, Jordan Downs, and the renovation of Compton College as well as Martin Luther King Hospital? Well, in C Compton, uh is a place to find real qualified workers. You will have more qualified applicants than you will jobs available. 
So really, you're able to take advantage of the myth that uh, Compton is somehow not willing to do the hard work or this is going to happen or that is going to happen. And we've worked in the Compton and Watts area for now over 15 years. And I can't remember an incident where we've lost a paper clip or pencil or anything. And we've had a very loyal uh, work crew to work with us on those projects. And as we were able to bring in local residents, uh, they learned to trade and hopefully were able to take that on to another project. So you change our entire life by having this person become a middle-class wage owner. Now, again, we're in the Crenshaw District, and I'd like to take a moment to show appreciation to O.G. Portis for allowing us to film this particular show at Morris uh Media Studios. This is a black-owned and operated business through and through. There's a black owner of the facility, and she's been over here for two and a half years creating an environment where we can get a different kind of message out to a, a national and international audience. So I just want to say appreciation to the sister for that. Now, also, in the, in the scenario you just described in Compton, California, let's break it down to individuals, because when you first put out the notice that you had jobs available, what was the, the pay scale for those uh, entry-level jobs, you know, the unskilled labor force, so to speak? Well, in government contracting, you deal with a thing called prevailing wage. And the prevailing wage says that in a given city in the United States, based on a matrix that has been established, the minimum level of pay has to be depending on the given trade that a person uh, may be landscaping, flooring, roofing, et cetera, et cetera. So as you get into livable wage jobs, they don't have uh, a minimum wage type of impact. They have a middle class uh, prevailing wage impact. I think that's what we have to get back to training our youth to become employed in these livable wage jobs. As we divested from the trades uh, some 20, 30 years ago, the Latino community seemed to invest in those trades that we were exiting. Now they hold a lot of those middle class jobs and African Americans have been left scrambling trying to figure out uh if you don't go to college, what do you do? You know, so you got a lot of young guys that we have to retrain them to work in those livable wage jobs, either in the factory or in the trades. Now, uh, I've shared with uh, my Twitter audience and my Facebook community the notion that you have taken guns out of people's hands, literally, and put construction implements in it. How does that play out in terms of your particular business model, your personal business model? Because you do have your own company, Black IPO, which is a construction management and engineering firm, and the hat that you wear as the president of the National Association of Minority Contractors. How have you been able to this point be able to go to a young person that had never worked in their life, didn't really have an understanding or comprehension of what it's like to, in one week, make as much money as they would have if they'd have been dealing drugs? Well, I think they've been working. They've just been working in a different capacity. So we're able to convert that hunger and that drive and tenacity into something that's more nine to five-ish than our alternative lifestyle. Uh, They're usually strong, very smart, uh, have a good aptitude. So we have to then retrain that into a nine to five mentality. Once you do that, it's hard to hold a thousand dollars in the same hand with a pistol. You know, they don't fit. You can't <laughs> grab it. So that will uh as you transition 
to that thousand dollar paycheck, your priorities change. First thing, you work so hard, you're so tired, you want to go home, go to sleep, and get some rest because you know it's sunrise tomorrow and you got to go back to work. So, in that, you'll change a person, you'll change a family, and hopefully, if we do enough of that, we'll change a community. Now, let's talk a little bit about your journey because to get into a position where you can carry a multi million dollar payroll, which you have in many instances, been tasked to do. How did you get to a point where you were comfortable going into the construction universe and being able to know that not only could you bid the job, once you got the job, you had the financial resources to carry payroll, insurance, all the things that usually eliminate black contractors from participation in the elite level of the industry? Well, first thing I would say... As an engineer, everything with me is process. What is the process for getting from point A to point B? If we can't figure those steps out, it's usually a path we won't go down. So then you get into your understanding of contracts. Contracts will make or break most small businesses because the payment terms are not in your favor so you have to be willing to negotiate and uh, understand the contract, understand where the pitfalls in the contract may be, and understand what leverage that uh, you have. So as you're negotiating, you always want to negotiate from a point that you understand totally the contract that the other person is trying to get you to enter into. So you can take some of the bad terms uh, out of the equation, and then you want to enhance most of the terms that are favorable to you. Then you can work your way through it. Um, We're going to digress for just a moment and and take our first caller on Uncle Bobby's Country Corner. This is Reed Alley, West Coast style. Who are we speaking with right now? Oh, Good evening. This is Kevin Haynes. Um, I, w- I wanted to call in. Uh, I'm glad to get to see you, Mr. Glenn Smith, back on the or Uncle Bobby back uh, back on the air, and uh, and Mr. Stimley, good to see you. I wanted to. I touched out. I reached out to you before, uh, Bobby. Um, I'm from San Diego and originally started in construction down there at the BCA. So I definitely wanted to, wanted to give my appreciation to you guys for all the, the hard work that you're doing and, and giving brothers opportunities to. Uh, in the trade to, you know, make a life for themselves and a livelihood. And uh, my, my, my question to you is, um, I know you guys are talking about kind of building up the community and encouraging brothers to, to uh, you know, look for work in the trades around their community. But, but would you, I, I've been kind of kicking around the idea to encourage brothers to, to maybe go out of town to these other uh you know, to other cities where there's plenty of work. And it's similar to, to going away to school, maybe go away to, to, to learn a trade uh, and, and take advantage of some of the money that's out here. Because uh, uh, I'm over here in Texas right now, and uh, the, there's a lot of work out here and a, and a lot of money to be made. What is your uh, 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 discipline in the construction industry, or your, your, your craft, if, if you will? I, I was a carpenter for about 12 years, and, and uh, about 08, you know, when the recession hit, there, there wasn't too much work. Uh, I ended up uh, getting retrained to be a crane operator. And so now uh, I'm sitting in the seat, you know, learning some new things, learning how to, how to build the, the crawler lattice boom crane. And, uh, and I mean, man, they, they keep me as busy as I want to be out here. Did you go through the apprenticeship program? Uh, I, 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 yes, yes, sir. I did. I, I didn't graduate, but but I started out down there in, in not really the old, the early days. Uh, the first time I met with with Mr. Lex Cash was over there on Federal, on Euclid and Federal. But then you guys got that new building down the street, you know, on 61st and Imperial, right? And uh, and started going to the classes down there. But but I actually moved on to the Union. 
and and then uh, you know journeyed out from there. Well, you know, you raised a good point in terms of the um, the uh, the flexibility of having a trade and and being able to to follow the work. Um, actually, I'm going to defer to Wendell in terms of what's happening in San Diego and what's happening in in, in other urban centers right now with respect to employment and entrepreneurial opportunities within the construction industry well i think what we have to be uh totally on guard against section three projects are coming up throughout the united states of america these are projects where they talk about rebuilding urban america and urban america is constantly under redevelopment the problem is we don't see our young men and women vendors and suppliers and subcontractors being part of that uh, redevelopment in their own communities so the task becomes for a young man a woman or a city council person or mayor as you are granting uh, federal dollars to participate in urban redevelopment under Section 3 is to make sure that the compliance of employment vendors and suppliers are consistent with the guidelines in which the money came down in the first place. It is egregious uh, for us to sit by and watch millions of and billions of dollars of redevelopment in local communities go on and not demand the right for the local residents to have a job or be a vendor and supplier on those projects. That's just unconscionable. Hey, I want to thank you for uh, calling in from Texas. If there's other people out there that would like to engage us in a discourse, the number here is 323 323- Two nine three 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 seven five. And before we go to break, uh, Wendell, he he raised a very interesting question that I think we have a solution to, and that is beginning to understand that when you start seeing uh, development, particularly in the urban area, you have a phrase that reflects what typically happens uh, when urban renewal becomes Negro the thing. Removal. It becomes Negro removal. A lot of that has to do with the fact that. We watch things happen without understanding that it's up to the community to begin to be cognizant of the people like this brother right here who have the skills, the wherewithal, and the financial resources once we claim the same territory that we do from a gang territorial perspective because those are our tax dollars. Can you kind of break down before we go to break the significance of how that tax dollar gives us a right to demand participation? Well, again, if you have Section 3 redevelopment, that came from the federal government. The federal government generates its money from taxing the citizens of the United States. So uh, I applaud the young man for being able to find work in Texas, but you shouldn't have to leave California to go to Texas or vice versa to be able to uh, find employment if your tax dollars are funding the projects in your local community and the federal government says per Section 3 uh, requirements that 10% of the workforce on those projects have to come from the local community in which it's in in the first place. So what we have to be vigilant on is the compliance of how things get done, understand how that works and then understand how we fit into the equation and then demand from our city council person, our congressperson, our mayor, our governor that compliance is adhered to so those young people get an opportunity for employment. When we come back from a very, very short break, we're going to talk about some projects that Wendell is engaged in that we now have a very exciting collaboration with the America I Can program that will allow us to close some of the gaps in terms of being able to attract even more young people that don't even know about the opportunities within the construction industry and then how we prepare them to not only get a job, 
but keep a job and become a stabilizing force in our community. So the number here is 323-293-3375, and you're listening to Uncle Bobby's Country Corner, where real men don't play. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. And if you've never been held down before, Okay, we're black with Wendell Stimley, president of the National Association of Minority Contractors and Black IP, a construction management and engineering firm. Wendell, um, one of the misconceptions we have as a, a culture is that the white man's ice is colder and lasts longer. You have had an opportunity to do a number of different projects. And we're going to get back to that in a minute because I've been waiting on this call for a while. We have on the line now Brother Kyle Douglas. He's principal of Inglewood High School, and he has agreed to collaborate with the National Association of Minority Contractors and Jim Brown's American program. Welcome to Uncle Bobby's Country Corner, where real men don't play. Well, thank you, Bobby, for having me, and I appreciate your time and all your efforts in the community, sir. Well, um... A few weeks ago, we started a journey that's going to culminate in being able to come into the community of Inglewood and interface with what we're calling uh, right now the Let's Go to Work, the American Way Initiative. And it's a pilot program that we're going to be starting. And by June, our goal is to take 25 kids that you presently have at the school, as we have talked about, and find work for them after they have completed the life management skills curriculum course and the boot camp program that the gentleman is sitting in the studio with me right now, Wendell Stemley. You haven't had a chance to meet Wendell yet, but uh, if you would, please give us a little background on how long you've been in Inglewood, some of the radical changes that happened at the school, and why you feel this is a, a, a great opportunity to address the needs of taking your student population and putting them on a a pathway to employment that is sustainable for a lifetime. Gotcha. Well, Uncle Bobby, one of the most basic and fundamental things that a, a young man needs to know is work ethic and the ability to work to provide life for himself and for his family. Um, you know, I grew up from the old adage, a man who does not work does not eat. So we want to teach our, our students. Uh, they're not children anymore. These are young men and young women, but we want to teach these youngsters uh, a work ethic that involves uh, going out and receiving the training that they need for whatever their particular field may be, uh, finding mentors in that area, and also just uh, putting the skill and the effort behind uh, the work because it's work. It, it, it's not play, it's work. It takes time. So I've been at Inglewood High School for the last four years. I started as assistant principal, and uh, I am the principal after Jose Gallegos, a young man who came in and started a similar program. But since I've been here, uh, we've seen a, a flight of young uh, black and Hispanics out of the, the school district. But with our new superintendent, Dr. Vincent Matthews, uh, with Dr. Carmen Beck, Dr. Antonio, these are all individuals, uh, Nora Roque, who are changing the tide and uh, not just relying on the influx of the Rams and the influx of the Chargers to rebuild the city, but they're partnering up with Mayor Butts and other uh, officials in the community, uh, with Eloy Morales, with some of our other officials in the area, and they're, they're mentoring young men and women into uh, employability and employment skills. They're, they're leading by example. They have their feet on the ground with them. They're on site. And these are all key things. Um, money's not the, 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 the only thing that will solve this problem. It's going to take presence. Uh, we need the presence of young men and women who have done other things besides sports, besides rapping, uh, and besides criminal activities to show our young men and women a better day and a better way. Well, I, I affectionately refer to uh, Brother Stimley as the LeBron James of the construction industry. One of the reasons that uh, I reached out to you and I just didn't turn my phone off and the, and the young brother Eric Robertson who made it possible for me to sit down and meet with you and begin this particular journey uh, he, and he shared with me the fact that you are dealing with some very serious issues in terms of like you say your the, the declining student population uh, profile a typical student right now at Inglewood High School for me well you're looking at uh think of Inglewood in general, everyone thinks about uh, gang banging, and that's nonsense. Our, our kids are kids. They want to ride skateboards. 
Uh, they want to just be athletes, be students, be scholars. Uh, but there's still those challenges that surround them every day. Uh, when they walk to and from school, they're faced with poverty. Uh, they're faced with ignorance. They're faced with lack of education. They're faced with uh, a, a lacking parents because many of our, our many of our students have parents who are in the penal system, uh, who are absent, or who just have, have not mastered the skills of being parents. So we're just trying to support the entire child, not just the academic portion of the child, but we also want to support them mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Um, I have a saying, and I, I stole this from someone because you know there's nothing new under the sun, but if you, if you fix a child and you send them back into a broken home, it does no good. So we're trying to fix the, the family. And you can't fix just one family. We're trying to fix the community of Inglewood. Uh, it starts with us here with the students at school, but in conjunction with the mayor's office, in conjunction with our superintendent, many of the local churches and officials, uh, with you, Bobby, with Eric. Eric walked in the door humble. I'm here to help. That, that's the kind of brother I love to work with. I, I don't want anything from you. I'm here to help. And our students need help. And again, presence. Your presence is far more important than anything else you could ever do for these students is to be present and to be just a force in their life. One of the things that uh, Wendell and I had been discussing before you came on the air was the absence of vocational training. And I shared with Wendell that you were amenable and pliable for integrating that back in to the extent that you can because you do have some facilities available and again our objective is to not just talk about it but be about it take 25 young men that we put through both the rigors of the uh, construction protocols and then the life management skills component and then be able to bleed into some of the construction opportunities that are emerging in Inglewood. And by all accounts, Inglewood is on fire with respect to development. Can I throw something out there, Bobby? I don't mean to cut you off, but you mentioned some things that are very important for the growth of Inglewood right now. Uh, first and foremost, uh, many years ago we had a wood shop where uh, young men learned carpentry. We had an auto shop. We had a CAD shop where they learned programming and computer skills. Many of those things were taken out, not just in Inglewood, but across the nation. Those skills were removed. But there's a new trend now where um, public education is heading back in that, in that direction. They're putting those wood shops and auto shops and, and uh, engineering and electronics. Those are all things that are coming back into the school. And the state's moving a little slow, but it's heading in that direction. So that's key for us. Here at Inglewood High School, we've already started down that path. We've started our law academy which is producing uh, young men and women who are interested in going into the field of law, uh, politics, things of that nature. We also have what we call our App Academy. Uh, one of the critical components for our students is we don't want them to be consumers of technology. We want them to design it. And we're working with a company called Digital Dragons, who that's their slogan, uh, who are teaching app design to our kids. So our, children, our students here are designing apps for the phone, and uh, which... If you, you know, these, you make millions of dollars off apps for phones because people are always buying the new game, the new app, the new thing to make their life easy. But the two things we're most excited about is our engineering uh, pathway, which is coming up uh, next year, which is going to be dealing with the construction trades as well as uh, mechanical and physical engineering, and our robotics program, which will be dealing with uh, just your typical robots as well as the drones. Our kids will be making, racing, flying, and producing drones from scratch. So we, we're excited about the direction uh, that Inglewood he High School is heading in, and we're just excited about the partnerships that are beginning to develop because we can't do it on our own. There are many things that we don't know, and this is where industry partners play a key role. Well, in that regard, um, one of the reasons I got excited about uh, the introduction through Eric to you is all of those elements are, are, are wonderful, and what we want to do this, I think, quite helpful to not only the school but to the community of Inglewood is creating a blueprint that's duplicatable. And I want to uh, share the uh, uh, microphone with Wendell in terms of the kind of impact it has if we can, uh, uh, again, get this initiative off the ground and by June show evidence that we can take a segment of the student population that's not college-bound and put them on a, on a pathway towards inclusion in the middle class. Okay, well, what we did at uh, NAMAC, we looked at the landscape from 
getting involved with San Diego Preparatory School, was this elementary, uh, McNair Middle School in DeKalb County, Georgia, which is a middle school. Uh, your concept with Inglewood High School. We also have our student chapter at Purdue University. So we're looking at the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics STEM programs from elementary school all the way through college. What I envision, I didn't want to get so bound on the college-bound student that we didn't have a blueprint for maybe a student that dropped out uh, maybe a young man or woman between 18 and 35 in that high employment gap. So then we started to come up with uh, employment of uh, skilled workers. According to the Department of Transportation, by 2004, they need 4,000, 4 million skilled workers to rebuild the infrastructure of America. Now, that was projected before the private equity component uh, was brought in by uh, President-elect Trump that the transportation bill may double. Well, if he needed four million workers at a billion dollars, at two billion dollars, you probably need eight million workers. So that tells me that what we have to get busy about, how do we fit into that equation? How does that young man or woman uh, in an impoverished community become employed in that equation? Somebody's going to get the job. Either that's going to be uh, imports, the status quo, uh, people other than us. So what we have to do is get out in front of the wave. So what I what we will be doing is having our uh, training program uh, at Joe uh, Westside Works in on Joseph Lowry in Atlanta be the first class that finishes the construction labor ready program uh, for the purpose of being able to work on some of these Department of Transportation uh, jobs. Uh, if that's successful, then we'll move it into Los Angeles, Cleveland, and other major cities to try to assure Chicago needs employment, needs examples of hard work will generate a positive benefit, and that will help uh, change our communities. So, uh, Wendell, while we got uh, uh, Brother Kyle on the phone, the blueprint for... Uh what it is that we want to institute at Inglewood High School comes out of the West Side Works uh, initiative. West Side Works is done in conjunction with the Atlanta Falcons and the owner, uh, Arthur Blanks. Is that correct? Yeah, his foundation built the building mm -hmm. where we will be hosting the training program. And the reason we also looked at uh, Jim Brown's program, American, I can train you to work in construction. I can train you to work for the Department of Transportation, what that looks like and what in that environment entails. What I can't train you in is a life management skill you have to have on the weekend after you got paid to make sure you make it back to work on Monday morning. That's a life management that we have to address that issue because some of our young people have just been inundated with the grief of unemployment for so long. Uh, if you make $1,000 on Friday and you haven't changed any of your life skills, potentially I could be hurting you more than I'm helping you. So we want to look at that aspect also. So uh, I know that you got a, a basketball game coming up here shortly over at Inglewood High School, uh, Brother Douglas. And I really want to say thank you so much for tuning in and, and chiming in. Uh, any tell party? Brother Douglas he's on my radar. Uh, he can hear you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hey. So any. Tell us, 
absolute pleasure. It's my absolute pleasure. Any parting remarks? Because again, um, we we've sat down and, and, and created the uh, the skeleton of this, and now it's time to put some uh, meat on that bone. And um, before the end of the week, um, I'll uh, complete that MOU. And again, we'll be using the uh, the model that that Wendell is starting uh, next month in in uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, at the West West Side Works facility. He has made it possible for me to uh, participate in the the rollout of that and introduce the value of life management skills running side by side with on the job training. Now, kind of just before you get off the phone, explain to him the outcome of that in six weeks after the kids have went through the uh, the, the training program that you have put together. Well, we're keeping it simple. We're focusing on labor. Uh, we're not trying to turn you into a uh, skilled journeyman carpenter <laughs> or a iron worker. We are focusing on labor and trying to get the young men and women capable of being part of the government mandates in the Section 3 10% local workers of a project's going on in your local community. Uh, the DOL, Department of Labor Requirements for all Department of Transportation contracts. So what I'm looking at is not trying to shoot for pie in the sky, but get boots on the ground, local workers on local projects. Okay, so again, uh, Kyle, thank you for taking time away from uh, an amazingly challenging job that you're dealing with right now and know that help is on the way and I'll be getting back with you later in the week so that we can iron out the, the kinks in the MOU and let's go to work, brother. Sounds good. Can I end on one note? Please. I want to let everybody know at Inglewood High School we have a, uh, a theme per se. It, it's our philosophy. Uh, it's a, a Frederick Douglass quote that says it's easier to educate a child than repair a broken man. Amen. And we believe strongly in that. And we here at Inglewood High School, we're building something spectacular uh, from the ground up. And we're doing it on our own. But, again, we know we believe firmly in partnerships and we believe firmly in matching up with people who have the skills and the assets that we need. And I just want to say one last thing, brother. Um, I'm not afraid to fly to Atlanta to check out the program. Um, so let's make some arrangements. Let's see what we can get out there and, and, and peep what's going on so we can get it designed here. And let's get these national models put together and, uh, and stop just thinking locally and let's start acting globally. So God bless you, gentlemen, and enjoy your night. I'm ahead in here and root my basketball team on, and I look forward to getting some work done. All right, man. Thanks so much for, for, for standing up for what it is that you are doing and doing it in such a way that it's evidentiary. And, and again, you'll be returning as we begin to make progress on our journey to affect positive social and economic change. Thank you so much, uh, Principal Doug, and I'll be looking forward to seeing you later this week. Sounds good, gentlemen. Talk to you later. All right. Uh, Wendell, um, while we are in a position to kind of just uh, talk about something that's real important, there's been a lot of public outcry about different people going to Washington, D.C. to interface with the incoming president. Having worked with uh, people from across the aisle throughout your illustrious career, can you speak to the need of being pragmatic as we deal with the transition from a Democratic administration to a Republican administration? As far as dealing with our problems Oof. and solving those. Well, that's a tall order, but... Here's one of the things that is uh, across the aisle. The United States has a trillion, $20 trillion deficit approaching. Regardless to if you're a Democrat or Republican, if you are like president that's are not liked, we can't sustain $20 trillion. It costs almost $100 million a day to pay the interest on $20 trillion. If we just could cut the deficit in half, we would have enough money probably to rebuild most of the inner cities in America. So this is something we have to take serious. We have to write our congressional people. We have to put more leverage on the government 
to bring the debt down because it is not sustainable for you to borrow $20 trillion and pay that type of interest. Uh, I mean, you're fooling yourself. We have to uh, get that under control. So some things happen in Washington that it doesn't matter who, what party is in uh, control, the issue is still the same. You still have to address the issue. People still need health care, still have to bring the debt down. You know, these things just are part of the fabric uh, uh, of the country. So I don't get myself uh, caught up a lot in which side of the, because they all tell you what you want to hear at a given point in time. The The fact of the matter is you have to look at what it makes logical as a business person, business sense. Now, here's an example, two things. Number one, uh, when I met you many years ago, uh, San Diego was woeful in their participation rate of African Americans in the construction trades. And it took a partnership, a legitimate partnership, a joint venture partnership with a very, very powerful man who happened to be diametrically opposed to everything you stand for socially and politically. Uh, explain how you were able to create a joint venture situation where you actually had skin in the game and how that has uh, f uh, unfolded over the years into a very profitable relationship with someone you don't really socialize with, per se. Well, you can have difference of opinion and still do business with someone. And that doesn't mean that they're a good person. They just believe what they believe, just like you believe what you believe, and we all think that we are right in our beliefs. But at the end of the day, business is kind of has its own dynamic to it. It operates on what works, what doesn't work, what makes money, what doesn't make money, what makes sense and what don't make sense. It doesn't really care about the emotion of the two individuals. It cares about the result on the paper. It's black and white. So once you can remove that, uh, what a person actually political philosophy is or their personal philosophy, it comes down to the two individuals being able to look at a transaction and say, okay, does this make economic sense for my company or for their company? And I think if people could get more business focused, uh, it would take a lot of the emotion out of, uh, of trying to do a deal. Now, uh, let's use as a backdrop this possible hypothetical, but maybe not for very long. If you had an opportunity and got a phone call from the Trump administration to come to the White House, would you take that meeting or not? Uh, I probably would take the meeting with my own individual uh, opinion. I would probably have some questions. Uh, right now, I believe we are talking about bringing in a lot of private equity to do uh, government projects. I would want to know, okay, well, what does that look like for the average citizen? What does that look like for employment in the local community? What that, does that look like for contracting and subcontracting opportunities within the small business and disadvantaged business? disabled business enterprise, woman-owned business enterprise. So I would have questions as to what is private equity in public projects going to look like because we don't want to be out here driving on the freeway owned by some person and we got to pay a toll to ride on it and <laughs> there's no uh, community benefit. So my question would be, uh, what's the community benefit in all the private equity that we're talking about putting into public projects? Do you feel confident enough in your capacity and your wherewithal, your expertise to be able to sit in a room with 
people who are shaping public policy at this point and make significant contributions to the areas that we've discussed throughout this program tonight. So it goes back to if you took that meeting, what would be your mindset? Well, be your objective. The advantage is I study, live, and operate in the local community. So I figure I know the local community market uh, pretty well. So I would be confident in the questions that I would have as they pertain to local community involvement, employment, business opportunity, vendor and supplier, uh, the young person trying to start a company. Why are they able to get a car loan, but they can take the same credit score and can't get a business loan? So the questions I have would be more from a local community perspective. So going forward, uh, you've now been president of the National Association of Minority Contractors for a couple of years. A couple of years down the road, what would you ideally envision happening that would expand the scope and impact of the National Association of Minority Contractors and Black IPL? One thing I've noticed that uh, my Latino members in Texas, Houston, may see things a little bit different than uh, the members in Atlanta. As I talk to members in Miami that are trying to start a chapter out of the Cuban community, they see things different than African Americans. So in the disadvantaged business program, you also have women-owned business enterprises that are white women, and you have uh, minority-owned women enterprises, and they see things different. So what you have to be is open-minded enough to hear everybody's concern and try to uh, put a plan together that is inclusive of all the minority contractors. And now we have a new group called a Veteran Business Association, which are veterans returning from Afghanistan who will be white males, uh, some of them. So that's another factor. So you can't lock yourself into one way of thinking without being able to listen to all the various minority groups and hopefully move the agenda forward. Well, Wendell, uh, we're down to about the last three minutes of the show. I want to acknowledge a couple of people who came in studio today that will be uh, frequent friends of my show. One is a brother by the name of Daryl Darden. When he was 17 years old, he played with the great Albert King, one of the greatest guitar players. He's going to be putting some music together so that I don't have to just always rely on uh, the traditional fair, so to speak. Daryl, thanks for coming in here today, man, and they'll get a, a chance to see what you do on the music side of the game. Also, uh, Eric, could you come here for a minute and bring uh, your gear with Eric is a brother that I've uh, had a chance to know. He's been uh, just an amazing cat. No, hold on. Yeah, and he um, he's one of the people that has worked very hard at trying to be a problem solver and a game changer in his own right. And he has created some apparel that, and he'll be one of the sponsors of my show. He's he's created an American legend jacket as well as a. Uh, let me see that other thing that you got there. Uh, so he's a part of the American family, and he's done a lot of work with the schools in the in the greater Los Angeles community. Solid brother Eric Robinson. Do you have a website yet? <laughs> Well, we're going to take care of that in, 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 in the coming future. But he's got some beautiful gear here, and uh, he's going to be doing some things along with the, the trail that we're traveling on because the object of this show uh, is to bring people into this theater right here that are actually making positive contributions to affecting change in the way we go about our day-to-day. -day. Um, Wendell? Thank you, man, for coming up from San Diego. Wendell has offices in five different cities, and he drove up from San Diego. He's catching a plane back to Atlanta in the morning, and uh, I'll be uh, with Wendell in Atlanta in February. Yeah. And, again, he's my version of uh, Easy Rollins. If you remember <laughs> the movie uh, Devil in the Blue Dress, This I'm the mouse, okay? 
And uh, I've been accused of being a, a bandwagon rider, coattail rider. Well, you know what? If he's got a fur coat on, I'm in pretty good shape. I've been knowing this brother for a number of years, and he's one of the few people that has constantly looked for ways to take people with talent and put them in a situation where they can live better and do better. And I'm going to simply close by saying this show is dedicated to bringing people into your range of view that are actually doing things to improve the quality of life for people that look like us. But we're not limited to that marketplace because we share this planet, we share this country, we share this city with folks from various walks of life. And when it comes to trying to label folks as this or that, I want each and every one that's listening to this show to do two things for me. Tell folks about my show and we will be downloading it on a YouTube format, and I will be uploading a podcast that I did with Jim Brown. It's going to answer a lot of questions as to what that brother has done, but more importantly, what he continues to do. Because I'm troubled by the fact that we got a lot of information flowing around now about who's this and who's that. I'm not even going to dignify that audience with using the phrase that sickens my stomach. Because at the end of the day, we need to measure people by what they do as opposed to what they say. I hope in some way this show has been helpful and useful. And as I close, thank you for letting me be myself again. This has been Uncle Bobby's Country Corner, where real men don't play. And we'll see you next week. Refuse to fight. Matter of fact, it's safe to say that they would rather switch than fight.